Good morning and welcome to Morning Movie News. Now, despite the disastrous box office turn of The Lone Ranger, which actually resulted in the parting of ways between producer Jerry Bruckheimer and Disney, despite doing fabulous business together outside of The Lone Ranger, Depp and Disney are still two peas in a pod, with three of the actor's six upcoming films for the studio. Uh, the reason this is a current topic is because it was just announced on Friday that Depp is officially returning for Alice in Wonderland 2 for Disney, uh, which will come out in 2016, the same year as Pirates 5, also for Disney. Uh, and it's interesting to see Disney not, not only continuing to bet so heavily on Depp, despite The Lone Ranger, but also Depp really changing his career and saying goodbye to the smaller films that won him his initial cult fan base, such as Donnie Brasco or Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. And it's actually reminiscent of another actor, Robert Downey Jr., who also started out in these smaller cult films and also for Disney has moved on to only really making these huge blockbusters. But as a result, both are pulling down enormous paychecks uh, and have become legitimate movie stars uh, but in an industry that has very few these days. And many claim even that movie star might be dead. But I think Downey Jr. and Depp are exceptions to that rule. And I think Depp wants to keep it that way, which might be why he's continuing. And you'll see we're going to go over his slate, upcoming slate of films in a moment, only really only making blockbusters. He's left these smaller films behind. And I think that's because the last one he made, Rum Diary, was such a box office disappointment that I think he just is doesn't feel it's worth the risk to his overall image. Uh, as I said, you know, a lot, a lot of money and his reputation are at stake here. Uh, so he has one small film on his resume, and we'll discuss it. Let's go through uh, what, he, what Johnny Depp has planned and decide if we think maybe if he's making a good idea or if he's playing it too safe. All right, so the first film he has coming up next is Transcendence, which is uh, Wally Pfister's directorial debut. Pfister is famously Christopher Nolan's DP, and he's going to step behind the camera uh, to call all the shots for the first time, and Johnny Depp is starring in the film, uh, which I think is very exciting. So we'll, we'll see how that does. I think that's a pretty solid bet. Next, he's making a film for David Coop, who's a very successful screenwriter, but his directing, not so great. Uh, I feel this is a risky film, it's called Mordecai, and basically it's like National Treasure, that Nicolas Cage film, only in Europe, with uh, Depp uh, playing a character, an art dealer, who's uh, trying to find some Nazi treasure through a special painting. So I guess it's a little like Da Vinci Code, too. Uh, that seems a little bit, uh, that seems like, not, that seems one of like The Tourist, you know, that film with Angelina Jolie. That one seems like a, a risky venture to me. Then he's doing Into the Woods, another musical. Uh, his musicals, not been uh, the best. Sweeney Todd. I thought Sweeney Todd was pretty good, actually, but uh, not a big box office hit. Uh, Into the Woods, though, is a Christmas release. It stars Meryl Streep, uh, Emily Blunt, Chris Pine, uh, I think Anna Kendrick. That one's shaping up pretty well. He plays the wolf, so that's also for Disney. That's a 2014 Christmas release. I think that's a pretty so uh, solid bet. Then he's making his only small film on his resume, London Fields. Uh, which is an Amber Heard movie, and he's very gallantly coming to her rescue to try and add some star power to the film. But I just feel Amber Heard is just at this point, I think you can just mark her off as box office poison. I think that no, no, nothing can help her films, really. I just think the audiences, uh, mainstream audiences are interested. But we'll see how much Depp helps. I mean, if his part is small, he'll remain unscathed. But if he's really put himself on the line here and taking a larger role, he could have another rum diary on his hands. So... Uh, I think he should just buy her flowers or something nice. All right, then he's making Alice in Wonderland 2 and Pirates 5, which will come out the same year. Now, uh, Pirates 5, I liked Pirates 4. I think the Pirates franchise is in good hands. Co the Contiki directors are coming on board from Norway. I think that's very exciting. I'm actually very excited for Pirates 5. But Alice in Wonderland 2 is a special situation uh, because the first film I think so many people did not enjoy, even though it made over a billion dollars at the box office, uh, one of the first films to do that. But I feel that if you were to ask people their, how they felt about the film, I think overall it would not be positive. I liked the film. It had very strong um, girl power uh, undercurrents, which I think rubbed a lot of people the wrong way, especially male moviegoers. And I think it was advertised uh, as a Johnny Depp kind of like crazy movie, but it wasn't really that. So I think that that's kind of also what caused a problem for it. But as the Hunger Games found out this weekend, even if your second entry fixes all the mistakes of the first, sometimes you just can't get over that first impression that you made with audiences, uh, which is unfortunate. But Alice in Wonderland might have that problem. Uh, second of all, the creative team, I don't know if it's being changed for the better. Tim Burton is not returning for Alice in Wonderland 2. Instead, Disney is promoting their Muppets director, James Bobin, who comes from uh, uh, Flight of the Concords from HBO, and I feel that my problem with the Muppets movies that he's directed, they're very, they're very TV-like. They're very uh, like, 
these very elaborate TV specials. And I don't know if he has what it takes to have that visual oomph that well, Alice in Wonderland was so famous for and I think partially responsible for it making so much money. And Robert Stromberg, the production designer, that landed him a directing gig on Maleficent. So he's not going to return to production design. He's going to probably stick with directing. I think Maleficent looks pretty fantastic. So I think he'll at least get it, no matter how it does critically, I think financially it should do pretty well just from the audience interests levels. So he'll get, at least get another directing gig. So he won't be returning. So I don't think this film could possibly repeat what Burton and Stromberg created with the first film. But maybe going smaller might help it. Maybe they'll be able to focus more on story. I don't know. But Mia Wasikowska is also slated to return. They're the only two people officially returning at this point. But also the other problem is, is when Alice in Wonderland started, it was the first adult reimagining of a fairy tale. Uh, and, but now we have Maleficent coming. We've had a, a lot of people try to duplicate that success. Not, no one's been able to do it yet. I think Oz the Great and Powerful to some degree did but uh, also a Stromberg production design film. But uh, you'll have Maleficent coming out, then you have Into the Woods, which Depp is also starring in. Uh, then you have Cinderella in 2015 with, Ke with Kenneth Branagh and Kate Blanchett, Branagh directing, uh, and Blanchett playing this evil stepmother. So I just think that you might, either you're, you might very likely tire the audience out, uh, especially if those films don't, they're tricky films to pull off. They, if, and they, if they, none of them stick the landing. I think all of them would have to stick the landing for Alice in Wonderland 2 to have a good shot at doing well at the box office. The only interesting thing though is that the Alice in Wonderland story, the first one, took place after the original Lewis Carroll uh, you know, narrative. So you have an adult Alice and you, really you have new territory for them to explore what they want to do in the story. And that might be a great side effect, a silver lining of all these um, films that they're making, dark fairy tales, they're telling the original classic stories, but if they want to continue with sequels, to, you know, to continue the franchises, which I think is obvious, an obviously good idea, they're going to have to create, you know, uh, they have new territory to explore. Uh, they can write something new and original, which is very exciting. I'd be interested to see what Alice would do as an adult in Wonderland uh, with, no, with no, um, no need to be loyal to the original material. So I think that's exciting, and we'll see what happens. But I think Depp's really gambling hard here on uh, these big fairy tale films. I think that without palate cleansers of him playing more normal, grounded characters, people might just get tired of seeing him, you know, basically playing Jack Sparrow in, in, in an array of different wigs. But I'm curious to hear what you guys think. When you hear Alice in Wonderland 2, you're like, oh, I definitely want to see that. Uh, what are your thoughts, and what are your thoughts of Depp's strategy in general, and do you think Disney's right to continue to bet on him so heavily? Uh, and really make, even, even though Robert Downey Jr. is also a star there, he doesn't make nearly as many films as Depp is making for the studio. So uh, that's the first story of the day. The second story also relates to Disney. It's over in Pixar, and Pixar is continuing to have problems. Uh, not only is, do they have no films coming out in 2014, because their director actually exited The Good Dinosaur, that's what's uh, caused the delay, so the film needs to be reworked, but uh, Bob Peterson exited that movie. But because of that, it's, they're saying that's the reason they have to have a lot of layoffs. Uh, as I reported earlier, uh, they closed their Canadian division, Pixar Canada closed down, but also it was just announced that they are having to lay off about 5% of their workforce, about 60 people about the, of the 1,200 that work for Pixar. And they're saying that, you know, it's just, it's just uh, growing, you know, having this year-long break, uh, but at the same time, it's like, well, you're a studio, you've been churning out films, uh, and when you start, <clears throat> after you kind of fix everything, your problems that you're having, won't well, you need to get back up to speed, and won't you then need these people? Uh, I just think at this point, this is almost like the smoke, where there's smoke, there's fire. I feel Pixar is, I get the feeling that they're in trouble, they're in jeopardy as a studio. I think that uh, they've had a number of films that have not been well received, that have not lived up to their reputation, uh, and I think that they are, I basically feel there's a rumor going around, a lot of people feel they're out of ideas. You know, they have a lot of sequels they're greenlighting. I think that the official reasoning would be, well, why not? People want to see these, but like, where's the Incredibles 2 sequel? I think the only sequel that people are demanding, uh, I guess Finding Dory, I'm excited about that. But still, they're not really churning out the original films that made them famous. So they have some on their slate coming up, this Good Dinosaur, the Inside Out film. But clearly, you know, they're not working. They have the director have to leave. I mean, I think they're worried about releasing an original film that isn't a return to form that they so desperately need. Uh, but we'll see what happens. There's, of course, that famous classic story uh, that, or, or legend, that there was a napkin in a diner that they wrote all their ideas down when they first started. And they, uh, I think uh, Up or Wally -E was the last idea on that napkin. And now they've got nothing. Uh, they got, they've got no more napkin.
So, I mean, I think I can sense a studio in trouble. Uh, and I, I think also this is part of the problem of being acquired by a bigger parent company. Uh, it really limits uh, the creative decisions you can make. You're not, you don't have total creative freedom. Uh, and I don't understand, you know, and also makes me question John Lasseter's leadership. Uh, you know, why can't he f help them find new good ideas? And why aren't, they bring, why aren't they bringing in new talent? You know, Pixar is a very closed circle. They like to bring their people up from the shorts. Uh, but I think maybe they need to maybe go to outside talent to bring them in. Look how well that worked with Brad Bird, bringing him over from the Iron Giant. Maybe they need to just go and find another director and uh, ask that person to step in and uh, maybe maybe inject some new ideas into the studio. So interesting to see. I mean, I guess everything has its ebb and flow, and Pixar had such a long high that I guess they, they're, they're due for a big crash. Uh, but I hope they can pull out of it, because they are really a wonderful studio that I think, at the end of the day, has made some wonderful films. And I think not since uh, Walt Disney himself has someone had such a big influence on the animation genre. OK, so that's the second story of the day. The third is that it's been reported that they're going to make a J.R.R. Tolkien biography. Uh, in the vein of uh, Finding Neverland, which took a look at J.M. Barry, who wrote by famously Peter Pan. And they're saying, you know, J.R.R. Tolkien wrote a fantastic, uh, wrote, I mean, lived a fantastic life, you know, uh, very fascinating. He not only went through uh, World War, but also he was friends with C.S. Lewis, and there was a group of writers who really changed fiction and created this uh, fantasy fiction and created these classic beloved uh, works. Now, I don't know, I think, it, I don't know if there's a huge interest in J.R.R. Tolkien. I, I mean, I don't, I don't know what the screenwriter's hook is. If they found a good hook, that might be great. Uh, Finding Neverland, I think, was a good film, but it certainly wasn't an instant classic or anything like that. And I think these things are tricky to pull off. And also because you want to be very realistic. We have Saving Mr. Banks coming up about the making of Mary Poppins. Uh, and I think there's some debate as to whether or not that has been white, uh, you know, it's been um, cleaned up a little bit so as to not make the, Dis the studio that's making it, Disney, uh, look bad in the way they treated uh, Travers. So, but I think that I'm, I'm not sure how I f feel about this. I'd be curious to know, but for the you Tolkien heads out there, uh, is this something that you think would make a great movie? Because are, are, you're more familiar with the author's life than I am. Uh, is this something you think would make a great movie? And do you think people will be interested in the man who wrote Lord of the Rings uh, just as they are interested in the novels themselves? Uh, so uh, write your thoughts down below. Those are the three stories. So let's get to the viewer question. Uh, the question comes from K.J. Buchane, who says, Question for you, Grace. Thank you, K.J. Uh, are we setting expe expectations for certain movies too high as fans, and that's causing them to fail? This is a fascinating question, and I think there's a lot of debate about fan fervor, how much fans are involved in, a, in the process of making a movie these days, when every stage is kind of like put out for their approval. Uh, but I think at the end of the day, there's nothing wrong with demanding quality for your money. And the real problem is that Hollywood is not living up to expectations. And I think the great example of that is the Hunger Games. I think Hunger Games is, this, is a rare example when I think expectations were not only met but exceeded. And it was wonderful to see that, you know, I think a lot of us were feeling maybe Hollywood just couldn't do it anymore. Uh, and to see them actually pull it off and that this was still possible was very encouraging and exciting. So I think that's a great, uh, I think the Hunger Games Catching Fire is a good example that, you know, we shouldn't give up and demanding quality because Hollywood can deliver still. So I would say that the real issue at hand here isn't the isn't the before the movie with the expectations, but the fan loyalty despite expectations not being met. Going to see uh, movies that you don't love two or three times in theaters despite not feeling that they're perfect. Uh, you know, you remember you're voting with your money, so uh, your ticket money. So when, and it's a lot of money these days. So when you pay and you see a film that you don't love two or three times anyway, Hollywood's like, well, why do I need to fix it and make more of an effort when the machine I have going? is bringing in a lot of people anyway. I mean, that's, I think, the reason that you have David Goyer in there. I mean, a number of you have been asking me uh, about the fact that it seems that he is the new Kevin Feige over at Warner Brothers uh, in charge of their DC universe. That seems to be the role they've given him. Uh, and a lot, of, a lot of you are concerned, myself as well, because uh, the guy doesn't, I don't think he knows what he's doing. I think he's an idea man, but I think he's not an execution guy. Uh, and I don't know why they would put someone in charge who Nolan left out intentionally on the last two films that were fantastic. So I think that's very frustrating to me that they would be like, hey, you know this guy that got benched? Let's put him back. Let's not even, don't just put him back in the game. Let him coach. I'd be like, oh, God, throw him off the team and, you know, th and thank him very nicely for his contribution. 
I don't know. By the way, some of you have been asking me who I think should take over. I don't know. I don't think there is any singular person that I think would be a perfect match. Uh, I, my vote, I've been thinking Vince Gilligan, but Gilligan just re-upped for television. He's going to stay with television, the Breaking Bad uh, creator and writer. But it's someone like that, maybe maybe they should get, maybe uh, I would go find the Game of Thrones guys. I'd be like, hey, what's it going to take for you to leave Game of Thrones? I know it's going to be a big paycheck, but hey, I'm Warner Brothers. I can afford it. Uh, but anyway, uh, moving back to the viewer question, so I feel that uh, the other, there's no doubt that the in, uh, internet has changed the way movies are made, but I think Hollywood needs to adapt. I think Hollywood is very slow to adapt and still hasn't fully, and I think the, not so much, I think that it's not expectations that are the problem when about attention before a movie. I think the problem there that is causing some disappointment, though, is spoilers, and I think studios need to be much better at hiding uh, certain aspects of their film from the press. For instance, Captain America 2 was shooting outside and they actually had interns holding up signs saying, please stop taking photos, you're ruining surprises in the movie. And fans were like, what are you crazy? This gets a ton, ton of hits online. What are you doing shooting outside? I think I need to find closed sets because I think one of the great things for The Dark Knight was that they did a great job hiding Keith Ledger's face and no one could really see his performance and they cre created a great amount of anticipation. Uh, but then, with The Dark Knight Rises, it's great to have a, a, an example in the same franchise. There were so many on-set photos that it just totally ruined the Talia al Ghul twist uh, before the movie even came out. And a lot of things were ruined that people knew about set pieces. Uh, and I think in, you know, the, the Lazarus pits or ended up being the prison that Rubain is from. But there were just, every, you know, I think studios need to really work on being more secretive because they need to realize there's a huge amount of scrutiny and they just have to deal with it. And they, have, they do have to deal with it. They can't just ignore it because they need to amaze fans who, who have inc these incredibly high expectations. It's the studio's responsibility to make sure they are met. Because I don't think anyone should be trying to dampen expectations. I think this kind of fan fervor is what's driving the industry to new highs and certainly new box office highs because people are so excited. So I don't think the result, I don't think the answer is to get less excited. I think the, it's, it's, it's important for studios to protect those expectations, honor them, and meet them. Uh, and Hollywood just needs to do that, uh, plain and simple. All right, thank you for your question. Those are the three stories of the day. Write down below what you think of them and your thoughts on the viewer question and anything you'd like to see covered tomorrow uh, and any questions you might have. Thanks for watching. Bye.